I'm Laura Natale, Mobility, Tech, Media and Telecom Director for SARE, the Centre on Regulation in Europe. And it's my pleasure to be introducing the second event in SARE's Mobility as a Service Week, where we'll be focusing on multimodal mobility strategies and digitalization. As an independent think tank in Brussels, working to advance top quality regulation practices in the network and infrastructure industries, SARE published a mass digital roadmap for public transport authorities in January, a few weeks after the European Commission published its Smart and Sustainable Mobility Communication at the tail end of 2020. Since then, we've been hearing about the Commission's plans for further developing mobility as a service for us. Um, and at our first event earlier this week, Transport Commissioner Adina Valéan talked about how to bring mass to life, preparing proposals due next year, both on multimodal digital mobility services and on mobility data sharing or reuse. We heard there from a variety of high level stakeholders about the read across flagship platform economy initiatives too, namely the Digital Markets Act and Data Governance Act, both, both of which Sarah uh, has been working on with speakers broadly aligning with the authors of the SARE report in recommending that public authorities establish clear rules for competition, adopt broad approaches to regulation and leverage digitalization and data so as to position themselves at the heart of data sharing management for then developing multimodal mobility and introducing intelligent pricing into transport systems. So we have a strong bone structure for diving further in today with some very practical experience sharing and recommendations. We're talking about multimodality and transport, of course, and to reflect that we have multimodal perspectives here. So both across the European Commission, city levels and national regulators, and we're very grateful for this. There'll be two almost back-to-back -back panels. The second on making data a common good, which their academic co-director, Professor Jan Kremer, will moderate, and he will introduce that panel when we get there. And now, though, we'd like to open our first panel on multimodal mobility strategies. We have report co-author and SER research fellow who you met at our earlier event this week to Yves Crozet. He'll be moderating. Um, Yves brings vast experience on these topics and along with his co-author jean claude Defi, who you'll meet in the second panel, has given very methodical thought to what um, effective strategies might be in this area and have to recommend that you read the full uh, report, which can be found on the SER website, SER.eu. As always, with SER events, viewers are warmly encouraged to submit questions you might have for the speakers on Slido. Uh, the hashtag for today is hashtag SERMAS, details on screen. Uh, and without any further ado, Eve, over to you to kick off the first panel. Thank you very much. Yes, my microphone is open now. So thank you, thank you, Lara, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for participating in the in this second event about uh, mobility as a service and digital roadmap. The first panel uh, is devoted on the topic of uh, uh, multimodality, because in the report uh, we, we prepare with uh, Jean Claude Dufy, uh, we put the, the focus on the fact that. Frankly speaking, there, there is something like a, a gap between the, the, the big ambitions uh, of uh, a lot of uh, local uh, decision makers uh, and the, the, the results. In the first report we, we published in, in 2019 about mass, we mentioned the fact that uh, except in the central part of the cities, the majority of uh, urban mobility is done motorized mobility is done by car. And even if in some cities, the, the, the model share of car is uh, uh, diminishing, clearly we, we still have uh, mainly uh, a lot of uh, single mode users uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cities, small cities and big cities. And then if we want to, to bridge the gap uh, between the ambitions of local decision makers and uh, the, 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 the concrete situation and the, the, the model split in the cities, uh, we, we have mainly to, 
to be more uh, ambitious uh, on both sides, public authorities and uh, uh, transport operators and so on. And it's why uh, to organize this, uh, this first panel, uh, I am I'm glad to, to welcome uh, two uh, participants, uh, Mr. Hans uh, Fibi from the Transport Authority uh, in Vienna and Austria, and uh, Isabel Van Dorn from the, the European Commission. And there was a, another gapped bridge uh, between the, the, the European level and the local level. At the first glance, it's not the, the, the mission of the, uh, the Commission, the European Commission, uh, to deal about uh, mobility in, uh, in cities, because it's a very local uh, topic. But when you, we look at the ambition about the CO2 emissions, uh, the ambition about digitalization, uh, the, the, the ambition about the, the cities more inclusive, uh, safer mobility and so on, Clearly, we, we have to, to, to organize a relation and discussion uh, between the cities and the European Union. And it's why uh, uh, we, we have invited uh, Hans Fibi from the uh, Vienna Authority of Transport and Isabel Van Dorn from the, uh, from the Commission. So I would like to, to start with my, my first question, maybe to uh, Mr. Fibi, because uh, we invited you uh, because from our point of view, the, the case study of Vienna is maybe a kind of best practice uh, when we look at once uh, the, the multimodality uh, situation, the evolution of model split, and also the, the digitalization. So uh, is it possible, uh, Mr. Febe, to uh, uh, give us some uh, insights about the situation in Vienna? Maybe uh, you can uh, introduce yourself in a more detailed way that uh, I have done. And maybe I have just two, two questions uh, and you can choose between the two uh, uh, and start with the second or the, the first. The, the first one is about the situation uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, what is the situation in, uh, uh, in Vienna today uh, uh, and, and the la during the last year uh, because of the pandemic? And then uh, my second question is uh, to have a broader view of what is the situation in Vienna in terms of urban mobility, in terms of digitalization, since maybe five years, or the last 10 years, and maybe what are your projects for the coming uh, decade? Thank you, Yves. Uh, I will uh, introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Hans Fieber, I'm the head of ITS Vienna region. We are the traf traffic telematics competence center for the Austrian provinces Vienna, Lower Austria, and Burgenland. That's more or less 40% of the Austrians live in this eastern uh, area of uh, Austria. We are a department of the Public Transport Association of the Greater Vienna Region 4, and we exist since 2006, and our main public service is A nach B, dot AT, so it's translated A to B, and it's a multimodal traffic and transport real-time information service. And it's online since more than 10 years now. And to your questions, I want to start with the big picture. And uh, let me then, uh, we will see it very clearly in the, in the uh, graphs. I brought a few graphs because a picture always shows more than, than um, Okay. Do you see? Do you see my? Do you see the picture? Not not yet. Not yet. Ah oh, yeah yeah. I need to click on it. Yes. Okay. Should be here. Yes. Yes. So what I brought to you here is the picture of Traffic Information Austria. When we started 2006, we had our own service, which more or less ended on the borders of the three provinces. We have nine provinces in Austria uh, and people didn't understand why is it, why is it, uh, why does it stop somewhere? So, so we made a big effort with many people. I have a slide about this also, but maybe later. And uh, here you see how the routing calculation per month, the number is the routing calculations per month that were performed 
over this service. So it's a it's a white label service, and everybody can can uh, use it. It's uh, discrimination free, uh, and you see that it's constantly growing since 2015. And you see also very clearly the two lockdowns of uh, last year and of this year, where people were not, uh, it was not possible for them to uh, go outside a lot. And so the traffic information went down. But in the end, we were, of course, at about 40,000 uh, root calculations per month, which is quite impressive for a population of uh, 8 million people uh, in, in all of Austria. Uh, what you clearly see is that there are different ways you can access it. There is web, there is app. Uh, there's also an XML service that people can integrate into their own, into their own uh, whatever service. Uh, there's also a REST API now. And what's also interesting is this uh, dark area on the top of the graph. That's the commuter calculator. If you want to have a tax refund for your commute, then you have to click on that service uh, and they calculate uh, how far is it? Uh, is it uh, accessible by car or also by public transport? So all this is calculated here. You get the sheet and you put it to your tax uh, thing, whatever. So what's clear from this graph is that uh, it's a success story and uh, people just use it a lot from many different services. What I also brought uh, is uh, the newest figures about uh, the modal split in Vienna from 2000 to 2020. So it's not just five years, it's quite a long time. And what's uh, quite impressive, I think, is the gray line, this is the cars, that goes down from almost 40 now to 27. So we have a massive decrease in car traffic in Vienna over the last 20 years. And this is, of course, Due to good public transport, you see growing public transport. Let's stop here, 2019, uh, on the first glance. And of course, uh, increasing uh, um, bike, bike infrastructure. And the walking is more or less constant, but constant walking is a good sign. If you don't do something for walking, it would decrease, but we but the city of Vienna does a lot for, for walking. So uh, what we saw till 2019 is that it's, it's uh, uh, constantly growing to the good side, let's call it like that. And then of course the pandemic came. What, what is good is that the car, the percentage of car traffic did not increase. What of course is a little tragedy is that public transport really went down and people used walking and cycling instead. So these are more or less the newest figure, figures about, uh, about the modal split in Vienna. And I think these two graphs are in some way uh, uh, connected. If you have good uh, public, if you have good public information about real-time multimodal traffic, then people uh, can use different modes of transport and are not, uh, are not fixed to a car ride. So th thank you, thank you, Mr. Mr. Phoebe. It's very, very, very interesting. And uh, now I, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, Isabel Vandon to uh, introduce uh, herself and to uh, maybe to, uh, to react to the presentation of uh, uh, Mr. Phoebe and mainly to, to explain what, what is possible for the Commission and the European Union to, uh, to, to push up a more sustainable urban mobility. Hello, everybody. Um, I am deputy head of uh, unit uh, uh, innovation and research, research um, um, recently appointed. And I have brought with me uh, the team uh, dealing with urban mobility. Um, 
And so um, urban mobility uh, is, um, is, a, is a topic of particular importance for the, for the EU and for the European Commission. And we have been dealing with that for, uh, for a, a, a certain time now, huh? more than I think 15 years that uh, the Commission has been present on urban mobility. And indeed, what is um, shown, um, uh, what was shown just before uh, by uh, Mr. Phoebe is um, is quite uh, um, quite good in terms of what happens in some cities, in some good cities or advanced cities like the like Vienna, is that uh, indeed we um, we see. Um, we have seen in our um, evaluation report of uh, urban mobility in the EU or the evaluation of the uh, EU approach to urban mobility uh, that indeed we still need to address uh, the congestion, we still need to address the air quality in cities, um, and of course we need to advance in, uh, in um, uh, to, let's say, to accompany the, the change to address um, uh, the, uh, climate issue and to, to become uh, climate neutral by 2050, as uh, mentioned in, uh, in the European Green Deal, and, um, and also um, urban mobility is also part of the uh, new strategy um, on transport and mobility at EU level. So, so clearly, uh, what we have seen in the, in the slide presented by Mr. Phoebe shows that we, we still need to uh, to progress, and maybe you have shown you have shown a best practice or a good practice. Then maybe the picture at EU level, I can tell you that it's not the same. So we need to bring everybody together to to reach our uh, our ambition in terms of uh, where we should go. Um, so, but it's um, the digital part is um, is an enabler, but clearly it's not the only uh, the only way. Uh, um, the only tool uh, we, we have uh, in our hands to, to meet our um, very important, uh, let's say, uh, goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, ju ju just uh, uh, immediately, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Van Dorn, uh, I think that uh, a very important thing uh, is the, the, the ITS directive and the revision of the ITS directive. Uh, uh, how do you see the uh, maybe the, the improvement uh, of the content of the ITS directive in the in the coming uh, months. So the ITS directive um, is indeed uh, one component, one of the tools we have uh, to contribute to achieve our. Um, or, um, or maybe to support a model shift and to support a multimodality. Um, I think that it was already mentioned uh, in the previous webinar. So the ITS directive um, is now uh, being reviewed. The ITS directive has a focus on road with a small part on uh, multimodality. And for the time being, uh, we have been working on uh, multimodality for passengers. So indeed, uh, we have a, a delegated regulation related to multimodality modality and we are currently uh, uh, starting the work to revise it to uh, let's say um, um, include maybe other data. Uh, the ITS directive uh, will also uh, use uh, when when we revise it we will also use uh, the experience we have uh, um, with um, uh, delegated regulation on multimodal uh, travel information services um, we will use this expertise to, uh, let's say, improve the, the directive uh, on, on ITS. Huh? And so we will come after the summer with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, I will be back to, to Mr. Phoebe uh, with, with another set of, of questions. Uh, clearly, um, w when we prepared the, the report with, uh, with Jean Claude Duffy and uh, also the, the report uh, two years ago, uh, we observed that there, there was in a lot of uh, big, in a lot of cities, a big institutional problems, uh, a difficulty of cooperation between all the public entities uh, we have uh, uh, in, in a city uh, the, the, at the size of the just a, a small municipality, a big one, and those those in charge of roads, those in charge of public transit, those maybe in charge of uh, uh, self-service biking, and so on. So, so my, my, my first question is, uh, how do you deal in, uh, in Vienna with the issue of the, uh, the cooperation between those different uh, uh, institutions? And uh, uh, maybe my, my, my second question is also about, about multimodality. 
do you have some uh, indicators about the fact that uh, more uh, commuters are using not only one single mode of transport, especially car or public transit, but are, are, are accepting to have a multimodal trip using, for instance, a bike plus a public transit and so on? Yes, um, I have uh, I have another uh, picture for you because, of course, it's quite uh, complicated uh, to uh, tell you how all this uh, all these organizations uh, work together. We have a layered approach. Uh, this this approach works for all of Austria. So we started in the Greater Vienna region, and now it's a, a big project that's. Um, or an organization that works for all of Austria. It's called Verkehrsauskunft Österreich, which means Traffic Information Austria. And what you see, let me start at the bottom and work our way up. This is the way uh, the, the um, value chain works. At the bottom, there's a traffic networks and everybody who has a part in a traffic network, be it rail, be it street, and, uh, and who has to care about this is in this uh, organization. And there is a digital traffic network uh, that's very accurate and very up to date. We need it for everything. And it's our, it's our lingua franca for, for all traffic information now in Austria. Uh, on, on basis of this, we have two, um, two separate uh, organizations, uh, one for real-time traffic information on roads. It's now uh, a, a project that is in, in, in this summer, it will become like uh, forever. Uh, in, uh, and we have a public transport um, a, um, a organization for pl public transport that collects all the schedules and real-time information for public transport and combines them. And then there is also an initiative for an online for an online uh, map uh, that is open government data, and all this information comes together in uh, Traffic Information Austria, which is a limited company uh, with many many stakeholders and many many shareholders, and everybody can use this information then uh, in a non-discriminatory way. I showed I showed just a few uh, images I stole from the website. Here in the middle, the most important is A to B. You see the A and the B. This is ours, but there are many others. I want to highlight just a few of them to the right. This is uh, the Traf Ministry of Finance who have this um, commuters calculator, uh, which is tax relevant. And then there is Weg Finder and Vienna Mobile uh, who have a very tight integration into mass services and payment and all this kind of new stuff. There is, there is also payment and ticketing uh, integrated in the other services, uh, but it's not this deep integration that starts more or less on the right here and everybody is working on that. Uh, what's quite interesting from, um, from an organizational point is that access is non-discriminating everywhere. Of course, we have the directive. Uh, some parts, especially to the lower right, are open government data, and some parts uh, have to be paid for on a marginal cost basis. And uh, some, some parts, for example, a base map is just a decision of the heads of construction from the different provinces. They made like a protocol and said, we want to have it and it's and and uh, the provinces do it. Uh, GIP AT is, um, is a registered association. Uh, as I already said, uh, Verkehrsauskunft Österreich is a limited company. Many others are civil law associations because that's what you become more or less automatic if you do something in Austria. So, so that's that's how we how we organize organize things. Of course, the new th this exists as you have already seen since quite some years. What we are uh, doing now is, of course, uh, 
opening the thing to mass, to ticketing, uh, we think that regular line-based services must be the backbone for mass. Uh, we cannot stop having, uh, having this. Uh, we think that there should not be subsidized mass services parallel to regular transport services. And we think that uh, the transport authorities should support and organize mass services. Uh, the traffic association of the Vienna region, uh, for example, uh, has is now just uh, setting up a system uh, to support smaller micro, micro mobility services like uh, little bus services in small towns. And we provide them with a dispatching center. So it's easy for them to buy a bus. It's easy for them to find someone who drives the bus, but to uh, set up for two, for two like bigger cars, a whole dispatching center is a big hassle for them. So we provide them with, the, with this uh, dispatching center. And so also it's not like it's now that somewhere in the uh, city bulletin, there is, a, there is a telephone number and people can look there and uh, phone, but uh, this this information is also in traffic Austria. And if you come to like, uh, let's say Ernst Brunn, because why would you not want to come to Ernst Brunn? Then you will find in our website, which telephone number you have to call so that they fetch you from the bus that you can reach Ernst Brunn. So that's, that's okay. how I think it should happen. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much. Maybe just, just another question, Mr. Phoebe. Uh, in the report, uh, we, we make the distinction uh, about mass uh, and mobility services, about what we can call the, the front office and the back office. So what you presented just before is mainly about what we call the front office, that is to say the relationship with the, the customer and the, uh, the, the, the real time uh, information and probably the, uh, the, the, the ticketing and so on. But there is also the, 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 the back office, uh, about the management of road, management of data, and uh, f just for uh, uh, as, as an example, uh, how, how do you organize the, uh, the cooperation between the, the, uh, the public transit uh, operator and the road management uh, system? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you've seen, we have this layered approach. The lower part of my picture that I showed earlier is more or less the, the back office. The information, there is a road, there is road construction, all this, and uh, there is there there is a bus, you know, the, at this time there will be a bus, and then there is this, this uh, up the value chain of traffic information, and in the end, of course, is, is ticketing and, and all these things. So uh, what, what I think is that there should be a non-discriminating access to this front services, to this front end. So everybody uh, should be able to have a front end in his website and um, have the information and, uh, and maybe sell a ticket. But what, what is very important for us is we, we are the traffic infrastructure and traffic service providers. Traffic infrastructure and traffic service is very costly. It's highly subsidized. Yeah, It's of little use if people do not know that they exist. If it's, it's not useful to have a bus, if nobody knows that the bus will come. So we want to guarantee complete and accurate real-time information that can be easily found. Uh, and, and so we provide this non-discriminating access to data and services, and we want to provide complete and accurate long time available real time information for the public to ensure that our real world services can be easily used, you know? So we think everybody can have uh, the service, but we want to also provide a service that people can uh, can depend on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. 
just maybe a, a question now to, to, to Isabel Van Dorn. Uh, th th there was a question coming from the from the audience from, from Slido, uh, and the question is very is very simple. It's <laughs> maybe not uh, not easy to to answer. The idea is uh, how it's possible for the the Commission for the uh, European Union to uh, uh, to produce uh, uh, in other cities at Vienna the same the, the same results. So how, how is it possible for for the EU to to help the the, the cities and Maybe another question, because when you prepare, we, we prepared a report with, uh, with Jean-Claude Dufy. Uh, we discussed with uh, a lot of uh, public transit authorities, and they, they, they were not very satisfied because uh, they, they were thinking that there was a big risk uh, at once on the front office and the back office uh, of the management of data and the opening of, uh, of tickets, for instance, for instance. And, how, how, how is it possible to to, to reduce uh, the uh, the fact that uh, public transit authority uh, are afraid by the the, the digital the digital revolution? Um, to answer your first question or the question from from um, from the audience is that uh, we have been doing that for a while now uh, to to support uh, the cities. Um, I would mention, for example, the. Um, the, the Civitas network that we have been uh, supporting for years now, uh, the, 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 um, and the, um, the money that the budget that we have uh, in, 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 in RNI, uh, that, that, that this, this is the, the kind of, um, let's say, support we, we have been providing. Um, a second answer to that is that uh, you know that uh, we have uh, now um, identified the mission. Uh, and one mission is on climate neutral cities, and we would like to achieve 100 climate neutral, neutral cities by 2030. And so also via this mechanism, we want also to, let's say, uh, gain uh, the, the best practice and to transfer the best practice uh, to other cities. So that could be another mechanism. And maybe a third answer is that maybe um, we are, uh, I mentioned that we have evaluated the urban mobility package of 2013. So um, after the summer, we will issue our new urban mobility package uh, so that uh, we can continue to support the, um, uh, the cities in their movement towards uh, uh, better, more sustainable urban mobility to achieve this, uh, this target of uh, climate neutrality. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first point. The second point is that um, we also, something maybe that we have not mentioned, I think that some of the answers were already provided uh, at the previous webinar, but I would like to go deeper. Um, we, um, we, are also, we have also seen that in the freight sector, the Digital uh, Transport and Logistic Forum um, has, um, has been useful uh, to bring all the stakeholders together to discuss uh, together the, the issues and and to let's say um, lead to a, 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 con, a convergence in terms of thoughts and so we believe that um, we need to bring uh, all the stakeholders around one table to discuss and maybe it would be difficult at the beginning to um, because everybody would explain their their viewpoint their needs uh, their barriers their constraints uh, but then when when step by step uh, they would listen to uh, each other uh, trust will be established so um, um, before or beside uh, coming with regular authority tools um, establishing a better dialogue um, is necessary okay thank you uh, maybe we are just a little less than 10 minutes for for this panel maybe just the the, the third and last wave of, of questions uh, one question is coming from the audience about the uh, what you mentioned, Mr. Phoebe, about the fact that you that there is a, a, a big reduction of uh, tra traffic in public transit. So, uh, do you think that it's uh, uh, just uh, uh, for a short time, or is it possible that uh, you have a, a loss uh, of patronage in the public transit for maybe for many years uh, in, in front of us? And uh, in relation with that. Uh, what is the, the, the financing issue uh, you have, for instance, in Vienna, uh, if you have less and less commercial revenues from the uh, public transit? 
I think it's very hard to predict what will happen after this pandemic. Um, I, I, it's hard to do it, but just let's try. Maybe, maybe let's try. Uh, um, what what makes what makes me confident that uh, that maybe things will get kind of normal is that you know. Uh, car traffic did not rise so much. People used uh, used um, more um, active ways of, of active modes of transport, like walking and uh, uh, biking. So maybe it maybe it will swing back like next year or something. I mean, I would hope that we have a we have a campaign which call which is called "Wir steigen wieder ein." We uh, we um, mount traf public traf transport again. It's a play of words; it's hard to translate. So there is there. The, we will do our best. Uh, what happened during the pandemic is that most of the services just kept going. The the traffic uh, association has long term contracts with the bus operators, so we could not just say, "Okay, don't uh, don't." Drive your bus because there are no kids who go to school. So, so public transport kept going, but of course people uh, do not uh, are afraid or whatever to use it, and so it's it's going down. We do transport models. We do a lot of transport models. I'm an old uh, uh, simulant, and so. Uh, it's hard to make predictions, you know. It's it's very hard to make predictions now. We we don't have we don't have a model for 2020 because there is no 2020. Um, and uh, what's also interesting is, of course, is that mass gets more urgent with uh, with COVID. Mass gets more urgent, but budgets get tighter. So we have like there are many influence factors. And my big hope is that we will we will all get our vaccination, and uh, after maybe two years, uh, uh, it will have been an episode, and uh, we will go on, and we will do we will have to do a lot of things. Not we technicians, but the the public relations people will have to do uh, their work again to bring people back. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Isabel Vendorn, just a question maybe about, about financing. Uh, last uh, Monday, uh, during the, the first webinar, the, 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 the commissioner mentioned the, 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 the issue of financing and pricing. Uh, maybe it's, it's time now, uh, because of the big ambition about uh, CO2 emissions and uh, to uh, to create more than the Euro vignettes uh, in, in, within the Euro vignette project, uh, a way uh, to charge all the uh, motorized mobility. I don't understand your question. <laughs> what, what about the, the fact that uh, uh, if you have to finance public transit now, uh, it's it's more and more financed uh, by public subsidies, and why not uh, to public to finance public transit? By a, a, a kind of urban toll of char or charging the road traffic. Uh, the, the topic of urban tolls. Um, so you um, uh, you have studied it, so you know that it is very very complex, and uh, and it is also um, a very sensitive topic. We see that here in Brussels. Uh, when the Brussels government uh, has, uh, has started to uh, to launch the ID, uh, because it has a, a, um, it has such a, an impact on your neighbors, for example, on your commuters, on your um, so it has a lot of, of impact. Uh, and so, before reflecting about the road toll, which could be a, a marvelous tool, uh, we need we need to see how to implement it, how, how acceptable it is. Um, you, I was in a, in a meeting with Toulouse uh, last week, and they explained to us that 70% um, of their daily um, of their daily trip uh, are um, uh, trips from home to uh, their uh, office. And so, uh, if you implement an urban toll, 
but you do not have the, the right facilities um, uh, um, already uh, available, the right alternative. Uh, so good parking uh, at, uh, at the railway station for the commuters or um, a good connection between home and the railway stations. So if you do not have all the other uh, tools uh, before you launch a road toll, um, I, I wish a good success to, to the politicians. But this is only my personal view. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Th th thank you, Isabel. It's, it's clear that uh, the, 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 the financing issue is a big one, and charging uh, road traffic is also a, a big issue, uh, mainly about uh, about acceptability. But 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 clearly, what what, what we observe now in Europe, in, in, in uh, and even in the UK, is that th there is a, 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 a big lack lack of commercial revenues for for the public transit, and it's difficult to to say in the same time we have to put uh, the public transit as the backbone of the system and then uh, to have more and more public subsidies to finance the, uh, the public transit with, without any uh, uh, revenue or, or income coming from uh, other kind of, of mobility. So thank you, uh, Hans, and thank you, Isabel, for participating in this uh, first uh, panel of the webinar. And we have now a five minutes break, uh, just uh, the, the, the coffee break. And uh, in five minutes, we start uh, with the second panel. Thank you. Goodbye.
So a very warm welcome, everyone, to this second part of our webinar, webinar today, where we will discuss the role of data for facilitating mobility as a service. My name is Jan Kramer, and I'm uh, the academic co-director, one of the academic co-directors here at CER and a professor of information systems at the University of Passau. The session is entitled Making Data a Common Good for Facilitating Mobility as a Service, maybe with a question mark also, make, making data a common good, and um, in particular here for multimobile mobility solutions. So in order to make multimodality work, collecting and sharing data between different operators, public transport and private transport operators is crucial. But the question that we address in this panel will also be specifically on the challenges of making such data and passenger data in particular more widely available, building on building a mobility data space really. Such a mobility data space would be a key asset for a sustainable mobility strategy as well. But uh, to date, mobility as a service also remains a challenge in most European cities, as we've heard in the previous panel. Opening up data assets also bears strategic risks that are well known or that well known large digital platforms may also enter the sphere, leverage their existing market power in, in a similar way that they probably did in, in the payment sector, for example. In our high level SAR webinar on mobility as a service just three days ago, the European Transport Commissioner Adina Valian said that we should not be naive in this respect. And she added that we need to avoid from the very beginning that new digital mobility services lead to market asymmetries or establish themselves as, as gatekeepers. You can still watch the webinar from uh, the 8th of March on SER's YouTube channel, but of course only after our webinar has concluded today. So the commission is currently also preparing a proposal on multimodal digital mobility services to be revealed next year and in parallel to that also an initiative on mobility data sharing and reuse. So our panel couldn't be more topical. And this of course is not a coincidence at SER. So the question for this panel is how can we all benefit from making data available in the mobility sector? And how do we ensure that the data does not work against the interests of those stakeholders that are actually contributing to that data? To address this question, we have invited a great panel of distinguished speakers today. We'll start with a presentation of Jean-Claude Defy, who is a co-author of the SER report on mobility as a service, uh, a digital roadmap for public transport authorities. And he will present us the main takeaways of that report with respect to the role of data and platforms for facilitating mobility as a service, especially multimodal mobility solutions. Afterwards, we'll have short interventions by each of our three other panelists, which are Fabian Colli, who is the head of the market monitoring department at the French Authority for transport regulation. Then we'll have Laurent Glorieux, who is vice president at Cityway, one of the leading software solution providers for mobility as a service. And uh, finally, we have um, Rob Römers, who is the head of data analytics at the Brussels public transport operator, STID. So I will address, introduce each of the panels a little bit more later before their interventions. Please be reminded again that you can send us questions via Slido and that we will take up these questions for our distinguished panelists. And without further ado, I want to introduce the first speaker, which is Jean-Claude Defy. Jean is a graduate at the, of the Central School of Lille, where he obtained a master degree in business management and computer science and a director of the program Mobility 3.0 uh, by ATEC ITS France. ATEC ITS France is an association that promotes exchanges and experiences between mobility professionals, companies, public actors, research and academia, and its members also include local authorities, state services, educational and research institutions, the main companies and engineering companies in the mobility sector. Jean is also an independent expert and as I said before, the co-author of the SER report. And um, with that, Jean, I want to give the floor to you with a short um, introduction of the report and its takeaways. Okay, thank you, uh, Jan. I would just uh, start with a, a short presentation. So I try to share my screen. I hope it will work. Do you see it? Does it work? Okay, 
So uh, let's start. Just a, a, a brief overview of, uh, of the report. Uh, the, the first point is, uh, well, why uh, are we speaking about mass? Why do we need to address? We have, uh, I will say, uh, some uh, uh, very uh, important stake. Uh, it's about uh, decarbonizing uh, individual mobility because car use is uh, the main, one of the main uh, source of uh, CO2 emission. It is 15%. Uh, just to remark that is in France 20 times higher than plain use, so uh, we have to focus on a real problem, I think. And we, do, we need to do it very shortly. Uh, we need to uh, reduce by 55% uh, our CO2 emission uh, before uh, 10 years. This is a very huge gap. Uh, and when you look at where these uh, CO2 emissions are located, they are mainly, mainly uh, in daily travel in conurbation, uh, because here, uh, this conurbation stands for 60% of mobility related passenger CO2 emissions. So this is where we need to, to, to concentrate our effort. It's not in, uh, I would say, in interurban, but mainly in uh, daily travel in conurbation. That means that we we'll need to have uh, an increase of public transport links between city centers and their internal, because within the city centers, it is already decarbonized. Uh, if you look now, uh, what the proposal of the report. Uh, uh, on the right part of this slide, you, you have the scheme uh, where you see uh, the gold connecting peripheries and agglomeration and conurbations. And we have four, uh, I will say, uh, tools to do that. Public transport capacity offer with financing, digital and infrastructure. Uh, PTA today are only in charge of financing and providing PT uh, public transport uh, supply. That, that uh, the proposal we, we, or the result of the report is that we need to shift from PTA to uh, OMA. That means organizing mobility authority. That means that they should be also in charge of public space. That means road space. Uh, so infrastructure part on the northwest of this diagram. And also uh, checking digitalization is serving goal of sustainable mobility. Uh, the market failure uh, the one of the biggest market failure is uh, the climate, uh, global climate warming. Uh, so uh, we cannot leave that to the market it's alone because it, it didn't work. And that's why we need to have some regulation. And uh, when in the previous panel, we speak about uh, common good, a common good is a public good that is, uh, so that is could be congested. That means that uh, one, could uh, uh, annoy another one by using it. This is typically the case of a public, uh, public uh, road, public space. That's why we need OMA to be in charge of uh, public space, for example, to have dedicated lanes for bicycle, for uh, buses and cars and coaches uh, to, to, to favor a model speed. And mass is the tool to favor uh, intermodality, because uh, intermodality for end user is first a cost. It's much more complex to manage different means of transport than to go by only one mode of transport, especially the car. So uh, the key question of uh, of uh, mass is for public authority for OMA should be should be which mode should I favor to which for which accessibility. For example, you could put a stress. Uh, uh, you could favor uh, modes that are the less public space consuming, that are the less CO2 emitting, for example. And here we really need to have a regulation. On, on, the, on the diagram on the, on the right part, you can see the three, I uh, will say, main bodies of public, uh, main actors of, uh, of mobility. The end users are main. But they will forget that this, this could lead to favor uh, car use because car use could be faster, but it could be also much more space consuming and much more CO2 uh, emitting. That's why we need to be at the center of these three uh, circles. And the smart mobility will be the one that will answer end user need, taking into account common, uh, common interest, general interest, with sustainable business model. That's why we need really to achieve in the coming decade. Now, now coming back to data, having seen that, uh, we have this uh, on this diagram, I will say the information chain. That means on the left part, you have the data, public and private data. That means mobility services data, car data, that is private man, geographic data. Then we need to 
gather all this data uh, under, uh, we'll say, a common uh, portal because alone these data by themselves have a very few added value. Together, they have a much more added value because then you can manage multimodality and intermodality. And on the right part, you can produce, I would say, different type of services, mass for end users. You could provide also digital observatory of mobility for uh, OMA, for uh, public, uh, public authorities. And of course, uh, you can uh, better, much better manage your networks. So uh, I, I have three questions there. Uh, the first one is that uh, on the right, on the left part, uh, mobility services data, uh, we have in the last decade, a huge wave of uh, opening public data to private sector. This is done now and the ITS directive did it. And we have uh, implemented uh, it, uh, I would say almost uh, everywhere in Europe. But we have now the car data, and I will say uh, also uh, the uh, uh, smartphone device that are uh, in, car, uh, in car use. Here the question is that could we have in the future uh, a flow coming from the private sector to the public sector, especially with this car data, because cars stand for 80% of uh, kilometer, uh, annual, yearly kilometer made. Uh, in, a, in all uh, European countries. And we have a very low level of uh, knowledge of, uh, this, uh, uh, of these moves. Where people start, where do they go, by which routes, at what time, what are the, the flows? And uh, I would say some actors like Google, Waze, uh, car manufacturers, they have a lot of data that could be very useful in that perspective. So question, should we have as a general interest data, should uh, OMA should have access or not to this data? Uh, in the uh, last French law on mobility, the answer was uh, was uh, made, and uh, it is yes. Uh, we have an, uh, in the last uh, French law on mobility, we have guarantee and access for public authority to have an access to this data only for uh, mobility knowledge purpose. Uh, the second question is about. Uh, when you have this uh, territorial data portal, should we ask for compatibility with public policies and fair competition? Uh, the report clearly answers yes, we should have, uh, we should deploy this. That means that we should not allow reuse of public data for services that damage uh, common good. That means public space or that uh, encourage, for example, uh, uh, mode use, like car use, that are not CO2 uh, emission uh, compatible with the uh, European Union objective. And we have just, uh, I will say, a week ago, adopted uh, in France uh, with the Public uh, Mobility Authority, uh, a license, a data license that uh, asks for a compatibility with public policies for all uh, reuse of public data. And on the right part, the third question is, who should uh, manage this kind of services? I would say it, it depends on the business model there. Uh, uh, in the report about mass, we are quite sure with uh, Yves Crozet that there is no business model for a uh, B2C business model possible for, I will say, uh, mobility for all. It will uh, be uh, set up and deployed by uh, public authorities. So here are, I would say, the, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, results of the report and the three questions that uh, I think each uh, city should uh, answer or maybe each uh, member state should answer. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jean, for this uh, very thoughtful um, presentation that gave us a lot of food for thought to kick up the discussion now. I would now like to give the word uh, to the next pa pa panelist, who is Fabian Couli. He's the head of the market monitoring department of the French Authority for Transport Regulation, and um, as such, also in, in charge of the law that um, Jean just uh, mentioned, the French law that he just mentioned. His department is in charge of controlling the opening of mobility data and um, thus in charge also of implementing the commission delegated regulation in connection to the Directive on the Provision of EU-wide Multimodal Travel Information Services. 
And with his department, he's also in charge of the regulation of mobility as a service under the French Mobility Act, Article 28, which John just alluded to, and um, which we will hear probably also more about today. And previously, Mr. Cooley served as a policy officer for the French Multimodal Information and Smart Ticketing Agency at the Ministry of Transport, and as a deputy director for the Southwestern Territorial Division of French Waterways Agency. So he certainly is an expert on the very topic that we will speaking about. And um, thank you very much, uh, Fabien, for, for being here. And uh, everyone, please remind it that you can send us questions via Slido that we will address um, after our opening statements by the panelists. So the floor is yours, Fabien. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, so to answer the question that John asked, uh, first, we have to know that uh, data are the core business of these platforms, private or public platforms, that's the core model. So if we want to make some of these data a common goods, we have to know that uh, there is a problem on the business model. So we have not to delete this business model because we need some public platform, but we need also some private platforms. It can be interesting for a small town to have uh, the information of this public transport on Google, because that's in an interesting way to promote the public transportation in this town. Uh, but we have also to avoid the misuse of the data by this platform. And we know that uh, the core business is not to sell a service to end users, it's in fact, to sell the data coming from this user to other uh, stakeholders. We have also to avoid the abuse of market power by these gatekeepers that uh, the European Commission wants to do uh, with the uh, Digital Markets Act. Uh, abuse uh, with other type of platform. And we can know that uh, perhaps uh, some big platform doesn't want to have a lot of competitors, uh, but also uh, abuse against uh, new entrants, new coming, on the market. Uh, so we have to define which type of, of data can be a common goods on all the data provided by uh, mass platform. So to, to answer the question of Zan on uh, the car data uh, is right, these data at the moment exist. You have to pay to have this data coming from uh, uh, phone operators or to uh, car manufacturers, but we have this data uh, a lot of countries have used that uh, during the COVID crisis, but they have to pay and to pay a lot because that's the core business of this platform to have this data. So perhaps we have to define on this data. So the, the French uh, Mobility Act have said that in order to uh, better plan uh, the transportation, uh, some public authorities can have access to statistical data coming from cars. So, so that's the first answer. Perhaps this answer can be a European answer and not just a French answer to this situation. Uh, for the limit of use of the common goods using license, we have the delegated regulation saying that we have not to restrict too much the reuse of data, of mobility data. So, but we can understand that uh, some uh, public authorities want to definite um, a border in the use of transportation, in the use of transportation data uh, in mass. Uh, I, I think that's uh, quite fair, in fact. Uh, but, but, but we have to be a, a bit careful about that. We have to remind that Thierry Le Breton have said that is allowed online, offline is allowed online, that is forbidden offline, it is forbidden online. So if we want to make such a limit on mass platform, we have to avoid this situation offline. So in the reality, if we don't want uh, ways to give some advice using the small roads, we have to avoid that in the reality. So to give uh, in the sign some information to the car uh, drivers in order to have the same sign uh, online and offline. And for the who manage 
the platform, so who manage the data. Uh, I think Jean is right for a lot of situation, public authority uh, will be the right person in order to put in place a mask because there is no other alternative. There is no uh, real business model uh, to put in place a complete mask using all type of transportation, local transportation, uh, to do this platform. But uh, we have also to make a place for other type of platform. Uh, that's the example I give at the beginning, such as Google giving information in small town. Uh, it's a way, in fact, to have a, a complete way to give information to a whole range of users, not just local users, who mainly prefers to have a local platform, a complete local platform, but we have also to think about tourists or about occasional traveler who wants to have a complete application, even if this application, a global application, just give small information on the local situation. So, so we have to uh, make a place to every actors, even if I, I agree with Jean, uh, local uh, authorities are the best stakeholders to put in place mass, a complete mass at local level. Thank you uh, very much, Fabien, for this uh, first intervention. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Laurent Glorieux. He's um, vice president at Cityway, one of the leading software companies on mobility as a service solutions for local governments and operators. And Laurent has been leading global teams for digital companies for more than 15 years and is passionate for the use of digitalization for sustainability and mobility goals. And against this industry experience, he will share some of the benefits, but maybe also some of the challenges of implementing uh, mobility as a service solutions with us, especially in the context of data. So Laurent, thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jan, and, and thank you for enabling me to talk about that fantastic topic because data is, is really uh, the fuel to technology today and to a lot of businesses. So it's great to be able to talk about it. Uh, so at, at Cityway, what we do is we provide white label mass platform for local authorities. So our goal is exactly to implement and enable a platform to be built, use that data in order for users uh, to uh, use intermodal mob mobility and to push them to a more sustainable behavior. So. Uh, I think Jean described uh, very efficiently what mass is about and, and what goals uh, are about mass. One of the main goals today, of course, is uh, sustainability and the decarbonization of, uh, of, of transport. Um, so that's what we try to implement and try to do with local authorities. So the idea is that through our platforms, through mass, uh, you can push people, you can show them better ways of uh, using mobility and, and change behaviors. Uh, so now, once we said that, the, uh, the, the difficulties of implementing a good mass platform resides a lot also within the data. Um, and, and right now, I must say that, that a lot of progress has been made in terms of traveler information. Um, and so it's more, it's easier, easier today, a little, little bit everywhere, to uh, be able to integrate uh, traveler information um, and be able to um, um, put in place uh, intermodal trip planners and all the information that travelers need um, in one place in order to go from A to B, which gives them a lot of information so that they can get out of their cars and not use their cars all the way. Um, and of course, with that, you not only need to have data that is open, that is public, that can be used, you also need data to be actionable. And by actionable, I mean you, you can use it really. And, and in order to be actionable, you, you need, of course, data to use some standards. Um, and, and we also help at City Web promote standards and use some standards uh, so that in the end, it makes it, you know, it's really easier to implement mass platforms everywhere. Um, and it provides more benefits to users and local authorities. Now, the, the limitations also that we see is when we talk about payment purchases, you know, uh, uh, some operators may be reluctant to share everything with everyone. Um, they may want to keep uh, personal advantage, kind of a commercial benefit, uh, especially if you're in a position of monopoly, 
you may want to use that position to your benefit and not share everything. And I think that here, there are still some obstacles that we need to uh, overcome in order for everyone to share, you know, maybe more openly all types of fares so that everybody and, and travelers can use all types of fares. Because it's one thing to say, okay, I can buy a ticket. It's, it's another thing to say, I can buy any type of ticket depending on my profiles. Because if, if, if only 5% of consumers use your public fare ticket and it's all you can use in mass, you won't be using mass. So, 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 so it's, it's, it's one obstacle that I see and, and the more we share data, the more uh, you know, operators are open also about sharing their fares and, and, and sharing their, their data. And, and the easier it will be for everyone to, uh, and there will be a benefit for everyone in fact in, in, in using that, that collective data. Um, and now th there's, th there can be also questions. So when we talk about data, um, I think that sometimes we focus on the data itself. Um, and it may be also a limitation about the way we think about it because data in itself sometimes doesn't mean much. Uh, what data, where data is important is by what we can achieve with it. So, uh, and I like what Google said in particular uh, you know, they are the masters at uh, managing data. Uh, they are not interested in data, in fact, they're in interested mostly in insights. So it's, it's some data has value, some data doesn't have value. So it's also important when putting in, in place policies to think about where we want to go, what we want to achieve, uh, what is important. And, and that is for, I mean, the first step before, uh, you know, implementing policies and, and uh, using the data that is relevant for, for, for these, these actions. Thank you, thank you, Laurent, uh, for uh, for sharing these insights. And finally, I would um, like to give the word to Rob Römers, who uh, will also share his thoughts on data as a common good for mobility as a service, and uh, building some on his practical insight for work as the head of data and analytics as the Brussels intercommunal transport company, the local uh, public transport operator in Brussels, which has an acronym so awkward I can't possibly pronounce it and um, so together with his data and analytics team Rob is responsible for making sure the the Brussels public transport operator leverages data in um, the best possible way strategic way without losing sight of the day-to-day -day operational benefits we are very excited to hear your thoughts uh, Rob now and afterwards we'll address some of the questions that you have sent us over Slido and some of the questions that have also been raised here at the panel. So Rob, please. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, it's one of the advantages of living in a multilingual city. All the acronyms are double and really strange. Uh, but for the rest, it's a really nice city, Brussels. Um, so what um, the other uh, guys already said is, is actually really true. And I think data as a common good is, is something that is very important. Uh, and I think for uh, the public sector, there's a role to be played there. For me, it's a little bit like access to capital for, for smaller companies, I think to keep a level playing field in the future to make sure that not only the Googles and Ubers can uh, launch new mobility services in the future, it's important that there is some sort of data set uh, available that these new players can use. Because like Fabian was already saying, that is indeed the raw matter that uh, that they need to uh, to develop their services. What, what I do notice a lot in, this, in these discussions is that there's a big difference, uh, like Laurent was saying, uh, between valuable data and non-valuable data and what public sector uh, co uh, considers as valuable and what the private sector con uh, considers as valuable. Because uh, most of the time when we talk to private sector, they're talking about the customer and the customer information are probably a marketing degree, uh, department will, will disagree a little bit if I say this, but for us as a public transport operator, we're mostly interested in usage data to optimize our network, to make sure that the right amount of vehicles and the, the, the right type of vehicles uh, are available at, uh, in the right place, uh, and that we offer the right type of, uh, of service and, and also of ticket uh, to our users. So one of the things we, we heard before was the question, how do you think that people are going to come back uh, to, to public transport or not, and what can you do? One of the things that we saw, for example, is that the, the usage of public transport is definitely changing where you used to have 100% commuters uh, that came every day, we now see them coming a lot less. So one of the things that uh, our sales and marketing department did, that's actually a very smart move, I thought, 
my personal opinion, uh, is to change a different type of ticket. Instead of saying you have a year ticket and you have a month ticket, we now give a 100 ride ticket that you can use over six months. So it actually encourages people to keep using public transport when they come back to keep the patronage of a fixed ticket for us as well, because funding obviously uh, remains important. But you don't make the choice between buy a single ticket or buy an abonnement uh, like you used to do. Uh, so there, I think we, we already have one first uh, big difference in the data. Uh, another thing that we were saying, uh, that Jean was asking was, what about car data? I think it's not only car data. I, I understand that's the biggest problem area that we, we can attack for CO2. But uh, what we saw in the city of Brussels, uh, or in the capital region, not just in the city, because we're a little bit bigger, um, is that there's actually a lot of services and a lot of lessons learned that we already had from the past, that there's a lot of, uh, over the last uh, three or four years, these, these sharing services, uh, electric kick scooters, uh, different types of, uh, uh, of mobility operators that are coming in, they had to get a license. And part of that licensing agreement was that, that they had to share data with the uh, public transport, uh, not the transport, sorry, the mobility operator. Uh, like Jean was saying, we actually have that role uh, in Brussels. Um, but what, what, did, what did they notice? You had the, indeed, they're all sharing data, but one sends their data in PDF, the other one sends it in an Excel, the other sends it in another format. It was very difficult to learn something from that. And one of the things that we took as a lessons learned for, for the new mass, so we have a mass pilot running at the moment with a limited set uh, of users. We have about 2,000 users in there now, uh, but we are writing for, uh, writing a, a proposal to, to build a new uh, larger uh, system for the future. And one of the lessons learned we're taking there is saying, oh, maybe we have to talk about standards. We have to talk about what type of data and how uh, we want to receive that data because data without context uh, really doesn't help us uh, a lot. And indeed, there's a question about sharing, eh? like uh, both of uh, my, my predecessors already said, uh, what data do I show? What data do you show? And do I trust you? Trust is a very big factor. We already work on that. We took a leading role in that as a public transport operator already a couple of years ago, because we saw within the capital region, uh, Brussels is multilingual, but we also have a lot of different departments and a, uh, a lot of uh, responsibilities that are split over different departments within the city uh, to bring those people together. So we now have a community that we call the Data Moves Brussels community, where we're actually exchanging things within um, the uh, the administrations to share data amongst us. I'm going to give you a very practical example. Uh, I buy my weather data uh, right now from a private company, but we have an environmental agency uh, in Brussels also where I could get that data uh, directly and we could prop maybe even share it uh, with other people afterwards. So there, uh, whether we are sharing between government or we're sh sharing with the private sector, I think reciprocity is very important. And I think everybody can benefit. Huh? Uh, how, how much is your service being used? If you look at the Ubers and the, the shared services, about 30%, they say, uh, of their rides uh, are currently uh, starting or stopping from a public transport stop. If we have an idea in the usage that they are expecting, we can make sure that in our role as backbone operator uh, for, um, for the city, that there is enough rides available. Because I think we have to start stopping, uh, stop thinking as I do my ride and you do your ride. It's one trip for the entire uh, three or four part of the multimodal uh, trip that the customer is doing. And it has to be one smooth ride. So we have to give each other enough information to optimize our services. It's the same thing now, if you if you take an Uber to go to the to the Metro, then you, the Metro is there and you take it and you expect to be able to take a share bike on the other side, but there are no bikes there, then you're gonna hate your entire trip. You're not just gonna hate the, the fact that there are no bikes. And there we need to be able to help each other, I think, to make sure that there's one uh, nice seamless ride uh, available. Thank you, uh, Rob. Very interesting. Um, also the, the, the trust issue apparently, and also on the, the very practicalities of, of how the data is being delivered then by the different uh, providers. Um, so with that, I will we'll go into the open discussion. Uh, we've received a couple uh, questions uh, from, from Slido. Um, but before, I want to uh, ask one question that Jean raised, or an issue that Jean raised, um, on 
how the data is used that is being made available. And uh, he was talking about a data license uh, there so that you, uh, the data needs to be um, used for a common good. Um, and I wanna ask uh, Fabien maybe um, on how that would look practically potentially and uh, what your thoughts on this are. Uh, okay, so for the license, there is a, a lot of conditions put on the delegated regulation. So we know that uh, reuser, so platforms, have to use this data neutrally without any bias. Uh, so th there is a lot of condition they have to uh, give in fact to the end users. So there is a lot of protection for the end users, but perhaps not for the public authorities. And for the license, the delegated regulation said that the license uh, shall in any event impose as few restrictions on reuse as possible and uh, shall not unnecessarily restrict possibility of reuse. So that's a problem. Uh, but we can think that the best use of the uh, public places is in fact a necessary restriction of the use of data. If uh, we put a lot, a lot of cars on uh, small roads, I think that is a problem. And perhaps this restriction, it's a necessary restriction. Uh, so we have to analyze that. I, I don't, I'm not really sure about that, but th th there is a few uh, answers giving uh, in the digital market tax, the next digital market tax that I said before, uh, Thierry Le Breton said that is allowed in the real life, is allowed, uh, allowed online. So if, and if we restrict something in the real life, we can restrict that online. So if public authorities give a lot of rules of using uh, the public spaces and uh, the common goods they have, perhaps it's a way in fact to say there is something done on the public places and you have to do the same use of data in order to have the same use of the public spaces online. So that's a way in fact to answer that. And if the public authorities has defined quite uh, strictly that they want to do as a public policies, perhaps it's a way in fact to say this restriction are not unnecessarily a restriction because that is a necessity for public authorities. Perhaps that is an analysis we can do when the Digital Markets Act uh, can be approved by the European Commission and the Parliament. Yeah, so very interesting linkages here also between the, the DMA and uh, the developments in the transport sector. Um, there was another question on, or there was some agreement actually on the panel that um, the public authorities and the public transport authorities would be the best to uh, place where this data is also being collected and put in use. And um, this raises the question, of course, that um, because this is at a very, very local level, um, whether there will be some fragmentation then with respect to the applications when I move from one city to another city, for example, um, what will uh, the landscape, the software landscape also, also look at then? Um, maybe a question for, for Laurent and then for, for Jean as well. Um, so what are your thoughts on this uh, in terms of, uh, do we have different apps? I mean, you white label software, so there is underlying, the software might be compatible to some degree, but how do you make sure that there's actually compatibility and also interoperability to some degree between these potentially um, isolated data silos in each of the cities? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And in fact, it, it can trigger a, a big debate because it's, it's more complex, complex than it sounds. Uh, so ver first thing I want to say is that when we are talking about mass, in fact, we are talking about nothing more or less than the digitalization of transportation. And I, I think it's uh, digitalization means a lot of things. It means it changes a lot of things in the way people behave and consume and also about the need for infrastructure and the flexibility of the offer and demand. And that's what is happening today through mass and not only mass with, with uh, the, the industry of uh, tr the transport. And so now we, if we focus on users, I mean, everybody travels one day from one city to another city and you want to have one app that can be used everywhere, right? Yes, at the same time, if you focus on users, you also notice that 95% of, of travels are commutes. 
So if you live in a city, 95% of all the travels will be done locally. So what, what do you want, in fact? Do you prefer to have uh, an app that you can use sometimes to go from one city to another, or that, well, or that concerns you know, some people, but not, not 95% of the, of the usage? Or do you want to have something that is really good, really ingrained, ingrained in the territory, and that really deals with the details and the, and the needs of the territory, uh, and that you know, concern 95% of, 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 of transportation? Uh, uh, so and another thing about it, and it's just a debate, right? Um, is uh, you know mass is a is a is a way it's a road it's it's not totally there yet so of course we want to have one app that can be used everywhere and where we can consume everything but on the way to get there uh, it's also very interesting to be able to have local initiatives where local authorities define very carefully and design very carefully their own mass applications and then. It can ex expand, we can interact bet between cities. Um, I'm sure that, and maybe that's a transition to, to, to Jean in, in terms of usage. Uh, both two brands are usually known locally. Number one is Google, it's known everywhere. And the other one is the local transport operator. Um, so both of them have their saying and have their place in the usage of uh, uh, and uh, of um, of users uh, locally. Maybe you can. Or uh, Jean, I don't know if you. Are. Yes, we are. We're running out of time a little bit, but Jean, please uh, have a, have a short. No, you you can have a short last word on on. Um, on no, what Laurent, okay. said. Laurent, answer perfectly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> then um, with this, uh, unfortunately. Um, that, that we have no time anymore on this panel. So as you've seen, we should do another one of these because uh, we would have much more time to discuss. So I'll hand over to uh, Lara for, for wrapping up uh, our today's webinar. Thank you so much, Jan. And yes, completely agree. Uh, via the medium of webinar, I think we've covered a lot of virtual ground uh, in both this panel and the one before. So very many thanks indeed to all our expert speakers and to our academics and moderators for joining us there. I think the breadth of material to talk through has been very striking today. And it also meant there's a lot more we could have heard about. Um, I'm conscious in particular of Isabel Van Dorn and her DG Move team who have plenty of multimodality initiatives in the works that they would have wanted to take more time to explain, but we'll look forward to covering these at future occasions. So stay tuned for those, um, as Serre will certainly stay very engaged on this topic. Uh, today, in, in a very brief nutshell, we've thought about existing regulation under revision, the Intelligent Transport Systems Directive, we've thought about ticketing, urban tolls, real-time impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on how people approach mobility, business models, trust, uh, especially on the data front, the first move, a lack of advantage, if you like, insofar as needing to build trust, and of course, the online offline leveling uh, in digital economy regulation having a ripple effect on mass development. Um, from a self perspective, public transport authorities evolving into organizing mobility authorities is absolutely a manifestation of mass as a new paradigm that really cuts across green and digital transitions. We remind, of course, that decarbonization is the core objective here, as the Commission reminded us today with their air quality and climate neutrality efforts. So SER will keep looking at best regulatory practice as Europe's Green New Deal evolves. Um, the SER report remains available on our website. You'll find there two details on many more events and studies launching soon, as early as next week, in fact. Um, it's busy here as ever, and we welcome any feedback you may have on this and on today's discussions. So please do reach out. Um, for any feedback you have on this and uh, for any real-time updates you'd like on our work, you can also sign up to our free SERV newsletter. Thanks too to all the SERV team for helping make our Mass Week happen. Once again, thank you to all our speakers. Uh, please all stay safe and look forward to our next meeting. Goodbye for today. Mm -hmm.